Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for the Child Neurology's webinar titled Knowing the Name of a Gene Can End Your Diagnostic Odyssey and Begin the Search for Treatment. My name is Cindy Wright and I am a program manager at the Child Neurology Foundation and I will be monitoring today's webinar. Without the support of our partners, today's presentation would not be possible. So we would like to thank all of our industry partners as well as all of our advocacy partners. So every year, the uh, Child Neurology Foundation identifies an important education initiative that impacts the entire child neurology community. And in 2021, this initiative was shortening the diagnostic odyssey. And we'd like to get to know our attendees a bit better. So to learn about your diagnostic odyssey and what um, you know about the child neurology community. So we are gonna start with a few polls. So this first poll is, how long did you wait to get a genetic diagnosis for your child after you first noticed symptoms? All right, we got a lot of non-carriers, so I guess we're professionals on here and advocates. That's great. We love having you here. Okay, so it looks like for this crowd, there's some who got it right away and some who have been waiting more than 10 years. I'll share the results. We can all see those. And on average, the length of time for symptoms onset is five years for a rare disease. Whoops. And the next poll we have for you today is What percentage of rare childhood disorders have a major neurologic effect? Best guess. All right. So it looks like most of you think 50 to 75%, few with more than 75 and a few with 25 to 50. The actual, according to NINDS's most recent report is 90%. So um, it's a big, big issue for this space. And our final poll is, how many child neurologists report over 25% of their patients are undiagnosed? Best guess. All right. Looks like most of you think seven in 10, which is a lot. Um, fortunately, it is not that bad. It is a third of um, neurologists. So a little better than you guys thought. So the next thing I wanted to talk about is uh, the Child Neurology Foundation's whole genome sequencing program. Many of you may know this, um, but for those of you that don't, we launched this program to offer whole genome sequencing to families at no cost with generous support from Illumina. And what we happened, we promoted it for a few weeks and we had 39 sites apply with 104 cases. We would have loved to accept all of these, but unfortunately we were limited to 25 cases. So we selected our five sites 
and 25 children received whole genome sequencing at no cost. Interestingly, we thought most of these applications would come from sort of smaller, medium-sized clinics, but a lot of large academic institutions, which we thought had their budget to do their own genetic testing, applied, which just really re-emphasized how difficult it is to get genetic testing done and approved. Um, so there is work to be done there, and we, uh, CNF is going to do what we can to help improve that process. So, so what the results were is we had six children who had a positive genetic diagnosis from the testing. Ten children had other, and what that meant was they had a variant of unknown significance. So because all this data gets stored at some point, they may be able to go back and get a diagnosis as more kids um, have that type of variant. Um, the other ones in this category would be people who had variants but they didn't match the symptoms the child was facing. So um, maybe something, but at this point it's unknown. And then nine children had no variants. So 24% of children received a diagnosis, which we are super excited about it. It's higher than we thought it was gonna be. These were the cases that the doctors had tried everything and hadn't gotten a diagnosis. So as one of a, the neurologists that participated said, can you imagine if 25% of children who currently are seeking a diagnosis could get a diagnosis? So just another reason why genetic testing is important and um, we need to do all we can to get more people access to it. Uh, and I am excited to stop talking and introduce our two speakers today, Gay and Nan, to talk more about the journey after a diagnosis, because we realize that getting a diagnosis really can be a whole new beginning for the diagnostic odyssey for a lot of families. So they're going to talk about that to us with uh, the perspective of a parent, as well as um, the medical perspective. We will have time for Q&A after the webinar, so please use the Q&A icon to submit your questions. And with that, I am honored to turn it over to Gay. Thanks, Cindy. Oops. Sorry, too far. Um, I just want to read my disclosure to you that I'm representing my own experience today as a mother of a rare disease adult child. And I do work for Neurogene in the role of patient advocacy and engagement. And all of the things that I share today are experiences from my own and not, um, they don't have anything to do with Neurogene. I'm here representing adcy5.org. Thank you. And I, um, I'm here just to talk to you about our experience of uh, having a child with a neurological disease that we didn't know what it was. Um, the diagnosis was a 15 year journey. And um, we're going to talk a little bit about what that was like and how things are different today. Um, but go ahead, Anne, do you wanna introduce yourself? Sure, thank you. Thanks so much, Cindy. And thanks, Gabe, for agreeing to do this with me. And uh, I am... Um, for those I haven't met, I'm a neurologist at Boston Children's Hospital. I run our epilepsy genetics program, which is a program I started with my genetic counselor partner, Beth Shidley, uh, about 10 years ago when we realized that there were a lot of genetics colleagues who saw a broad range of abnormalities, including a lot of children with neurological issues, uh, but who weren't necessarily focusing on epilepsy. And then a lot of epileptologists who had an inkling that some of their patients might have genetic disorders, but we really didn't have a collective of individuals thinking specifically about genes for epilepsy. And when we started, there were really a couple of handfuls of genes, but we knew that the deluge was coming and, and it did come. And we wanted to set up a program where we could specifically address genetics of epilepsy in particular, but also use the same principles across other neurological disciplines. So that's my perspective as a clinician. And then in the lab side, we're trying to model some of the genes that we find. And it's really been a huge motivation to hear from families about their experiences and to be able to take these experiences to our institutional leaders and say, these are the priorities our patients are bringing to us. How can we, our pediatric institutions in particular, meet those priorities? So Anne, I want to start off by talking a little bit about, um, you know, I shared that it was 15 years for us to get a diagnosis for our daughter. And 
we had gone all over the country getting all kinds of tests and, you know, it was syndromes and chromosomes and, um, you know, MRIs and nerve conduction studies. And, you know, I can't even go through all of the list, but it took whole genome sequencing for us to get a diagnosis. And, you know, there's such that there's such a relief for families when they get a diagnosis because they've gone through this journey, whether it's a year or five years or 15 years, it's still a very difficult time for families. And then you get this diagnosis that is letters and numbers like we did. And there weren't other families and there wasn't something to read about. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about how your discussion with families is different now than it might've been even five years ago before you were able to give them a diagnosis. That's a great question. I mean, our whole approach to childhood neurological diseases is different. Um, and I think we've seen some really great examples of how there's been just a whole concept change in terms of how we approach families when they first come. So we, when I was in training about 20 or so years ago, um, we would see a child, for example, with infantile spasms, which is one of the more common of the rare first year of life epilepsy syndromes. And 20 years ago, you can get an MRI. It was still sort of new. You wouldn't always get it right away, but it was sort of, okay, we're gonna do an MRI. We're gonna try to figure out what's going on here. That was sort of, you know, news 20, 25 years ago. Um, and we do the MRI. And if we didn't have a, a clear cause from the history and examining the child and the MRI, it was cause unknown. And that was like, as if that was a thing, right? As if that was an actual entity, idiopathic infantile spasms. And that it, was our, that was actually our diagnosis for a long time. It was undiagnosed mitochondrial disease. Yeah, yeah. And what does that mean? Yeah. What, and what, what does that mean? And how can you call it a diagnosis? It's sort of a, it's, you know, idiopathic epilepsy and idiopathic infantile spasm sounds like it's an actual thing, but it's just a sort of, Hey, we're not sure. It does mean we took a careful look and we did what we could do today, but it, it really means we're, we're not sure. And so that, you know, as unsatisfying as that was to us, uh, it was, I'm sure, several times more unsatisfying to the families who were like, this major change just happened in our whole outlook for our child and they can't even tell us why. Um, and I bring up that specific example because, you know, MRI, again, 10 years prior to that wasn't common practice. And it clearly revolutionized the way we look at children with weakness on one side, children with epilepsy, children with movement disorders, children with any number of child neurological disorders. And when we had our symposium at the CNF this last fall, you know, I remember Ann Berg from Lurie Children's and Northwestern saying, you know, would you ever see a patient, if you're a child neurologist, would you ever see a patient with a neurological disorder and not do an MRI? And would an insurance company ever tell you, you can't do an MRI? And you would just, you wouldn't stand for that. And you know, why are we, I guess, you know, her point really was like, why are we debating whether genetic testing should and shouldn't be done, which is still happening in some circles. And why are we sort of having to fight so hard to get it done when there are clear data now showing that it's revolutionizing our ability to diagnose patients. Not everybody, it's not always successful as Cindy showed us the numbers, but it's clearly made a huge dent. And so with the infantile spasms example, what's different now between five years ago, our clinical team, uh, who really has a nice algorithm for evaluation of patients with infantile spasms and then treatment uh, algorithms and so on, have worked into not only their recommendations, but into our electronic power chart ordering thing that any resident who sees a patient and admits them will do, that they'll get an you know, initial genetic evaluation and then they'll consult us if they have questions or they need to do an additional evaluation. It's sort of now part of, you know, you do electrolytes, you do labs, you do an MRI, you do a genetic evaluation. It's become part of the first line evaluation to the kids. That's really because great. And just like you were saying before, you see all these children with epilepsy and we have these, the, we have these diseases that used to be, you know, stand on their own, like cerebral palsy, ataxia, autism, all of these things that we used to give as a diagnosis, you used to give as a diagnosis and we would receive as a diagnosis. And then now today we can say, well, what is actually behind that? And I think, you know, part of this conversation today is really letting families know that the diagnosis that you might've had a couple of years ago, even go back and do genetic testing, find out why these are, why these things are happening and look at something like epilepsy as more of a symptom rather than the end result. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think, you know, I was, I was talking to one of our junior colleagues who's looking at the genetics of CP. And when I first you know, told some of the senior colleagues in our department, you know, you know, Sid's working on this project in genetics of CP. There's this great guy, Michael Kruer, at another institution has agreed to collaborate with him and bring together this training grant that he wants to do. Um, and a lot of people are like, 
CP is not genetic. It's like, well, so, you know, we have to sort of reconceptualize not just for families, but for ourselves, you know, for our colleagues, because right. the first thing that comes to my mind with a lot of these disorders is not necessarily genetic, even though in my epilepsy world, of course it's genetic if it's not acquired. And I think what's really changed is that we've you know, really started to see this sort of shift in mindset from you know, our colleagues. But the other thing that I think is really sort of driving things forward is that families are more informed. So, you know, it used to be that we'd say, all right, we're going to embark on this journey with you. We're going to try to get a copy number assessment with this microarray. We're going to try to do an epilepsy panel. And if that's negative, we're going to argue with insurance and they're going to say no, and then we're going to appeal and they're going to say no, and we're going to appeal. And then if all else fails, we'll put you in touch with our research coordinator who can put you into some one of many research studies. And whether it's in the brain malformation door, you could walk in the epilepsy door, you could walk in the unknown rare disorders door, you could walk into the NIH Undiagnosed Disease Network. Any of those would be possible research studies. And then you'll wait somewhere between six months to six decades for a possible answer. And we won't be able to tell you if it's negative. And that was that was what we, you know, 10 years ago, that's what we did. Today, people are coming and saying, okay, so I've enrolled in the Broad Institute's Red Genomes Program. Um, I've enrolled in this, but we wanna be able to have you look at our data. So how do you do a data transfer? You know, and if you think we could convince the insurance company to get a genome for us, that's fine. But if not, we've already got a genome cooking across town. And it's like, wow, this is incredible. Right. And, and you know, then once they once they do all of that and they drive that and they and they get their diagnosis, then what? Yeah, then we're sort of, you know, a little bit having to harken back. I think one of the big things that's changed in terms of even genetic testing is we've really appreciated the importance of pretest counseling. Um, because you have to tell people straight up at the beginning, we might find something, we might not find anything, or we might find some unknown, we'll have to do more tests and eva evaluate. And even if we find something, our first goal is to find something. But even if we find something, there may or may not be a direct treatment consequence. You know, it might help inform our prognosis. It might help put you in touch with other families who have children with the same genetic condition, uh, which would let you look at other conditions that might be important. It might let you and your epileptologist realize that, wow, there's a really big movement disorder component to this genetic dis diagnosis. And, Maybe rather than sort of brushing that aside during the epilepsy visits, we need to find a movement disorder partner to address those. So there's lots of things that happen, but I think the truth is that a lot of people come because they're hoping that there'll be a specific cure for a specific genetic diagnosis, and we all hope that. And a lot of the pretest counseling that increasingly our genetic counselors do, because they sit with us in the treatment visits as well as we're moving forward after a diagnosis, is that we need, we need to have, be realistic. You know, we're at least we'll be able to help you find other families, and at least we'll be able to make sure you're not on the wrong meds if there are meds that are contraindicated. And maybe we'll be able to try a rational approach to treatment, and perhaps there will be a clinical trial sometime for gene modifying and disease modifying therapy. That was a bit of a pipe dream five years ago, and it's, you know, it's still a bit of a, a whiteboard exercise of how much, how far can we go, but there are some now recent examples of gene-specific, variant-specific child-specific treatments that have, have actually been put forth, including some that are in clinical trials. So the nice example recently in the epilepsy world is Dravet syndrome with a trial for an ASO, an antisense oligonucleotide, which is, you know, many, many different sites across the country are already doing the early phase one, phase two. We're hoping lots more sites will do the phase three. It's exciting. It's a little bit anxiety provoking because we're, you know, these are injections and it's material being injected. Yeah. It's, it's all very new. It's really new, but it, it, there's promise from the preclinical work. And I think the, the win here already is that we've been able to have, you know, the importance of doing this for rare diseases has been acknowledged by the FDA, by drug companies who maybe in the past wouldn't have been willing to take these on and by scientists whose labs could study anything. Um, and are largely rewarded for getting NIH grants on much more, you know, basic projects or much more sort of hypothesis-driven, secure research projects. Clinical trials is, is not that. It, there are hypotheses, but it's a much higher risk endeavor in lots of different ways. And I, I think just the fact that there's any of these now looking at child neurological diseases, Angelman syndrome, there's some other programs developing, it's been, it's a shift in thinking, I, you know, when people first started treating, talking about treating child neurological diseases that were genetic in origin, the sort of standard retort was, right, but we're too late. 
We should have been there in utero. We should have been there as soon as the child was born. We're, we're too late to intervene. It may not be the case. And actually, there's some nice data coming from animal models, which is you know, a nice system where we can do experiments that we wouldn't necessarily ever subject people to. But now some initial preclinical data coming forward that, you know, yeah, we you can modify disease. So that that's justification for now looking at, at the children. That's really exciting. I would not have predicted this 10 years ago. And I think, um, you know, one of the th reasons why you and Cindy asked me to do this is so that I could share a little bit about the, you know, I think a lot of families think about the home run, right? They think about getting a cure. And um, what I want to share is how getting a cure isn't always, you know, it's okay sometimes to have treatment because life can change. So, you know, it's important for families to get a diagnosis, learn what the gene is, learn about the gene, find out who's researching it, you know, look at journal articles that are available, find out whose names are on them, email them, call them. You know, those are the kind of things that we did as a family and we were able to bring together researchers to help our family. Um, and I think, you know, you bring up a good point about, you know, families come prepared to you. And, you know, they don't, you, you might have a, a different conversation prepped when they walk in the room and they come in and they with the, all these files and they've, you know, like you said, spoken to all these different places and, you know, they're creating mouse models on their own. So, um, you know, and it's kind of what we did. And, and because we were, you know, our daughter's now 24 and, um, you know, we were kind of ahead of all of this genetic testing, we were able to get into a research study. And that's why we got this, got the uh, whole genome sequencing. But, you know, I really want to share with families that are on the call and also clin clinicians and researchers that um, even if families don't, if there's not a treatment for the gene and families don't have information about the disease and clinicians and researchers don't have information about the disease, it can be life-changing to get a diagnosis. So um, Cindy, can you just bring up the slide that I shared with you? So um, the slide that Cindy's going to share is a couple of pictures of my daughter, Lily. And um, the one on the left is a picture that was taken before her diagnosis. And the one on the right is after her diagnosis. And the things that I wanna point out to you is, um, you know, on the left, let's, let's just compare the, the wheelchairs and the, the posture. But the, the chair on the left is a very, um, it's a very involved chair. It's, it has a lot of accommodations on it. You can see it has small wheels on it so that Lily was not able to propel herself or move around. She was completely dependent on the person pushing her chair. It has you know, armrests, it has a custom molded seat, a custom molded back, it has a headrest, and the foot plates are turned so that she can control the movements from her feet. Um, she has a, a genetic diagnosis of ADCY5 related dyskinesia, and it's a movement disorder. So what that meant was we were trying to use a lot of medications that were um, subsiding the movements that would try to help her sleep. That was the biggest thing. And getting the diagnosis, you know, just like Anne said, we were given these letters and we didn't really know what to do with it. And then um, over time, and this isn't that much time because we got the diagnosis in 2013. And on the right is a picture of Lily just within the past few weeks. Um, we were able to put together some researchers and, and get some attention to the disease and figure out what the pathway is and what, what could we use with drugs that are already available that could perhaps work on the pathway. So we did find certain drugs that did work and um, intentionally I'm not sharing those drugs with you. You can do a search on the disease, but you know, I'm not here to talk about the specifics of, of um, her care or treatment but I wanna to talk to you about the difference that it can make. So on the right, you can see that with this new wheelchair, she has, um, there's no headrest, there's no custom molded seat or, um, or back. There are no shoulder straps. Um, there's nothing holding her feet in place. Um, she does not have um, any kind of, you know, restriction on her so that she can move herself around independently. And, she can get in and out of this chair by herself from a sofa to the chair, the chair back to the sofa. And all of that was done because of us learning about the gene, the gene learning about um, how the pathway works, working with researchers, working with the clinician. So it's really important to work with your doctor and, and make sure that you have a team built that can learn about it with you and you can be a part of the conversation. So, um, Cindy, I don't know if you flashed up the question and answer 
because we're at that time. No, that was an accident. <laughs> okay, sorry. All right, that's fine. So, um, so we can, you know, we can take the slide down, and um, you know, I'm happy to answer questions when we get to there. But Anne, you know, let's talk a little bit about, you know, when you're when a family comes to you and they have the diagnosis and they want to do science like this and they want to hit the home run. How do you kind of curb their enthusiasm and make sure that you're managing expectations and remind them that everything that we're doing until there's a treatment that's actually approved by the FDA that's been tested, you know, in animal models and, you know, clinical trials, if they're experiments, you know, there are things that really the pros and cons have to be weighed very closely with your doctor and, and with the, the site having the trials. So how do you, as a, as a uh, physician that's seen these families help them kind of weigh the pros and cons. Yeah, I mean, I think managing expectations is a key part of it. And I would say, you know, I, I wanna share the enthusiasm and share the hope, but also be realistic and just talk about some you know, practical things, as you said, that need to be considered. Every, everything we do in medicine in terms of treatment is weighing risks and benefits, right? It, it, FDA approved drugs, off-label use of drugs in children. You know, that's that's part of what we do in, in pediatrics, especially we're often using drugs that weren't necessarily approved in children, but we're using them off-label in children. That's common practice, everybody does that. And every time we write a prescription for anything, we're weighing risks and benefits. And so when we then think about experimental therapies, we then think about novel therapies or things that have been even through a trial and an FDA approved, but haven't been through years of post-marketing surveillance to hear about the one in 2000 individuals with some catastrophic side effect. Every single time we're doing something, we're taking some risks, but we're hoping for some benefits and we're looking to science to help us assess what the benefits could be. But we're looking at our clinical knowledge to think about what the risks and benefits should be in balance. And so I think, you know, there are situations where you have a child in a family where an older sibling has had a set of neurological conditions, the second, and everybody says, well, this has got to be a fluke. Maybe there was something in utero. This, you know, this is something rare. It can never happen again. And then the, the family has a second child with the same condition. And then everybody says, oh, wait, maybe it is genetic. Um, you know, a lot of times that sort of scenario arose because when the first child was born, there were no genetic tests, like actually none. Um, and then, you know, in 2006, there was just a copy number assessment you could do if you were lucky and your hospital would let you send it. Um, and then, you know, 2012, 13, you could maybe start to do clinical exomes in some places and so on. So, you know, a lot of the previously undiagnosed older siblings were previously undiagnosed because there simply weren't tests to send. Right. Um, now that <clears throat> so the second sibling comes, you say, this has got to be genetic let's see if we can find something that's potentially treatable based on the mechanism, whatever it happens to be, and you find something. Um, sometimes it's something straightforward, like a biochemical abnormality, and you can replete something. And you know, we, we all hope for that because simple oral or G-tube, G-tube administration of something that could actually fix what your cells are missing or replace what your cells are missing, wouldn't that be so great? And if it could get into the brain and get into the neurons, that would be fine. And the truth is we, you know, we want to find those things and we want to be able to treat appropriately, but they're very few and far between. You know, it's one in several hundred cases that we'll see and sequence will have something like that. You still yeah, do. And something that works on one child might not work on the next. And it may work on the child who's two, but not work on older sibling who's 10 mm -hmm. because we miss the window and you know that's very painful it's very you know very very hard for the families to realize wow if we'd known in the past we, it was something that we possibly couldn't have known because there wasn't that knowledge but if we had known what a different outcome there could have been but these scenarios are pretty rare um, and these are not the norm and it's not the everyday what's more common is all right here's an infant with seizures that start in the first month of life we've got a short list in our mind of what the top three genes might be in a long list of other genes that could be involved, we can and should look for that. And in those that short list of genes, some of them actually have pretty major treatment implications, not with gene therapy and not with anything super high risk, but with good old off-the-shelf medications. But they're good old off-the-shelf medications that you wouldn't necessarily try in an infant for all sorts of practical reasons. And so you can have 
treatment guiding therapy, even if it's not precision therapy, for example, um, just by knowing the gene. Um, and you know, sometimes you find a gene answer, let's say for a child with a movement disorder and history of seizures as a baby, and you find a PRRT2 variant and you had the child on Tegretol anyway, or carbamazepine anyway for the seizures. And it seems to happen to help the movement disorder and, and say, great, now we know. And uh, you know, my colleagues will say, well, you didn't need that genetic test to tell you to use carbamazepine. You have the child on carbamazepine anyway. And they say, that's ex absolutely right. But I'm gonna keep the child on carbamazepine now rather than weaning it off and let them kind of do- And you can stop that. running around, right? Searching. Stop running around. We're not gonna sort of say, oh, wait, we came off. Why did everything recur? Why is the movement disorder worse? Gee, it must be something carbamazepine responsive. We're not gonna do that to the child and the family. Right. We're gonna actively make choices about the risks and benefits of staying on medicines. And so I think these are all sort of the, I think the, the thousands of anecdotes we all have in our head are what are, being, what are sort of what we try to bring to the conversation about where do we go next? But I didn't really answer your question of how do we manage the expectations and how do we try to get to cure? I think a big part of what I've tried to do is to encourage families to work with other families, to work with foundations, gene-based groups, because really there you can not only drive the agenda collectively to NIH, FDA, researchers, bring people in, and there's lots of wonderful single gene examples where the communities that have been brought together are really sort of pushing and driving the research. Um, but you can also then have something that I think is really important to, to think about, which is a you know acknowledgement that every child is different and may need different things and different symptoms addressed and maybe different genetic, you know, specific genetic abnormalities that are leading to their conditions. But if you go with a collective approach, it, it is really sort of an approach that is seeking to treat all of the kids. Um, right. start I, with a, one. Yeah, start with, even if you start with one, or maybe you say, hey, we're not gonna start with one. You're gonna start with a small group and a small trial. It has generalizability and has applicability then to all the kids out there with that genetic disorder. So, and while you're doing that, which might be a really small group of people, you can also on the other end say, well, let's get these diagnostic labs and clinical teams and everybody, let's get them going into overdrive because if that drug gets approved for every child with gene, you know, fill in the blank, we should know who those hundred kids are around the country who would be eligible for the trial rather than, hey, this works, Where's, where are all the people? Where is everybody? Let, let's keep them lined up and ready because- so where, do you, where do you send families when they get a diagnosis? You know, like when we got our diagnosis- You had to create your own. <laughs> we created our own, right? It was just us. But what about families um, who are in the same situation today? Like, where do you turn, where do they, where should they go? Um, you know, is it clintrials.gov? Obviously their clinician is the first place to go, but beyond that, um, you know, they're all, they're turning to the internet, right? They're turning to Facebook. They're trying to find other people. They're trying to find anything they can about the gene. Um, <clears throat> but how do you recommend that they really start all of this? Yeah. So part of what we do when we have a return of results visit, whether it's a clinical test that was sent or a research study found something, we confirmed it clinically and we sit down, we always have our physician and a genetic counselor together, um, each hearing each other's part. Um, and we typically will end with sort of a list of, you know, here are the organizations that are specifically out there already. And if there isn't a single gene group or an umbrella organization that would encompass that specific gene, we'll often send them to broader groups like the Rare Epilepsies Network for an epilepsy um, or you know, to places like this. You know, Cindy probably knows the one other person out there with the same thing because they've contacted her as well. So Child Neurology Foundation, Child Neurology Society, other groups like that. And also sort of, you know, I call a friend. You know, if this is a disorder that there's only five cases reported and one of them is from, you know, Leipzig, I'll call the neurogenetics person in Leipzig and say, hey, you may not know me, but I went to some talk you gave a couple years ago and wasn't that a great talk? And, you know, can I put this person in touch with you, this family in touch with yeah, you? We did, a, we, did a, we did a lot of that. We would yeah. uh, go to conferences and we would go up to the speakers afterwards and speak to them. And, um, I remember even call, getting a newsletter and reading about another rare disease family and calling the institution that put out the newsletter and saying, I want to meet this family, connect me to this family. And they did. And I'm actually still, um, I'm still connected to that family. So it's a lot of just grassroots networking and pulling things together and, um, and knowing that this is, you know, it's a, it's a long process. It's not something that 
happens overnight. And, and just because you can raise money to do it doesn't mean that it's all going to come together. And it's, it's all, um, you know, it's, it's new, it's experiments, and we're all, we're all trying to do it as safely as possible. So um, what about um, when families come and uh, they don't still have a diagnosis? And we've talked a little bit about, you know, continue doing the genetic testing, but, you know, at what point do they start you know, treating the symptoms. Like, you know, we had to come to that point before we got the diagnosis. I remember um, Lily's neurologist saying to us, you know, you all have been through so much. This has been decade, you know, well, it hadn't been decades, but it was, you know, a decade. And, you know, we were still trying to do testing and we were still going all over the country and, and, you know, we just weren't willing to stop. And I think a lot of families are like that. And, um, and we really didn't stop. So, I'm not sure I would tell any family to stop. I would, I want everyone to continue to try. And I think there are a lot more tools, but, you know, at some point we kind of had to take a step back and say, okay, what is available and how can we make Lily's life as full as we can now with what we know? Um, and I think that, you know, I rem I can still remember exactly where I was standing when I was on the phone and the doctor saying that to me. And I thought I can't stop and just treat the symptoms. Like, um, I have to keep going and I have to know what's causing this. So, you know, those conversations, you have such a short amount of time when you're sitting down with a family, you know, it's, it's not like you have hours on end to have these conversations and the conversation that we're having right now is going to be about 30 minutes. You don't have 30 minutes with family. So how do you get all this in with them? Part of it is that, and as you've alluded to, it's, it's a long-term conversation, right? Or if I'm doing a consultation um, and someone else is managing the symptoms, I'm sort of honing in on the let's figure out why while somebody else is sort of working on the symptoms in parallel or for my own patients whom I have been following, it's, you know, it's always been, it's not an or, but it's an and. You know, we would like to find a diagnosis, specific diagnosis. We're gonna keep looking for a specific diagnosis, but that could take weeks, months, years, and we may not actually get there even though we know uh, that there is something. Um, so we can't wait for for that. So we do have to do some symptomatic treatment, which is really a lot of the, you know, the, the bread and butter child neurology treatment is largely symptom based, not disease mechanism based. Um, and it's collective experience, just like most of medicine. And so you're sort of bringing the best approach to all of these various symptoms as you can. Um, and usually it's the one that's the most acute, the most life threatening, the one that brings you the most difficulty with walking or the most mm -hmm. hospitalizations that kind of screams the loudest and says, okay, treat me. And so it's the, the seizures, the movement disorder, but also the, the tone abnormalities of dystonia that, that tend to have a lot of symptom, it requires symptoms to be addressed. But there's also right. sort of the longer term developmental issues, right? With you need early intervention, you need the schools to work. So, but it's, it's an and. And so to be honest, most of what happens in a child neurology office is the symptom treatment. Um, and a small portion of it is, you know, yes, it's been 16 years, but let's remember to think about why. And I think that's what we've sort of honed in on with the genetic approaches. You have to sort of think about why for every patient. You might think about why and do an MRI and say, oh, wow, there was a hemorrhage. And think about why was there a hemorrhage? Was there a bleeding problem? Was there a genetic reason for the bleeding problem? But at least you know, okay, the hemorrhage is the reason. The bleeding is and the scarring is the reason for the weakness and the motor difficulty and the seizures and all those things. So at least you have kind of an answer for those symptoms. But for everybody else where there's no answer for the symptoms, especially the worst symptoms, you have to keep looking. And when it's not acquired and you don't have a reason for it, then it's presumed genetic. And that's a shift in mentality that we're really trying to push. It's presumed genetic. So in 2021, here's what we can do. We're gonna do these tests. We're gonna look specifically for these things. And specifically because your child has these symptoms, I'm gonna look for specifically these genes, but I'm gonna be open-minded, but there may be other things I don't know about yet. That's where we are. If we come back with nothing, my initial hypothesis doesn't change. I still presume genetic. It's just that I don't have the evidence yet to support that hypothesis and to refine it and make it more specific. And you keep but, going. So you gotta keep going. And that's where we have not set up some, you know, a systematic approach in our field that we need to set up. You know, if, if somebody has an unknown, you don't necessarily want to go to the doctor every year for them to come sit there and say, yep, still don't know. We looked again. Yeah. And that's, that's, you know, it feels futile. It's not a good use of the family. Well, that's, you know, something I share with parents is that really we know walking into you that we are going to have a very limited amount of time. 
So do your homework first, right? Child Neurology Foundation has a great list of how to prepare to go to a neurology visit mm -hmm. and answer those questions, have it written out, um, have three suggestions. Like I'm thinking that we might need to do X, Y, Z. Um, you know, I, um, it's, it's kind of like running an IEP meeting, right? You just, you kind of have to be the advocate when you walk in and say, I know I have, you know, five or 10 minutes with you. These are my top concerns. This is how I think, you know, maybe these are some ideas that we could look at. Do you think this is right? And really work as a team with your clinician. The other thing I tell families is to get a copy of the medical records, keep them in a binder, make sure that they're all with you. Because if I'm sitting with you and I know that my time is limited, I don't want you to have to spin around and go to your computer and try to look up results. I want to know my notebook and have it tabbed by date and test so that I can save as much of your time because your time is so valuable to families. Yeah, I think it's also, you know, it, it it's generational, obviously, as you alluded to the computer, you know, when I think depending on when people trained, they were used to more or less information at their fingertips, you know, some of us from the dark ages, we're not used to having things at our fingertips. And so, you know, our MO is a little bit more to have a conversation and, and but you knew the data, right? There were, right. and it wasn't in like little wormholes in the computer, you knew the data right. was in your hands. Right. Um, and if you're like, what the, when was that last EEG? You'd flip to your little tab, just like you're saying, look at the notebook. Yes. And, you know, we haven't all adapted to the electronic notebook in the same way. Mm -hmm. um, and so I will say with, you know, gratitude to all of my patients who do this, when families do that, I mean, I still think it's my job to do it. So, but, sure, but I, think, I think there's a lot we can do to make your job easier. Yeah, but when families do and, you know, come with that information, we can start with, okay, we're at this common place of information. Let's take the next step as opposed to sort of, as you said, backfilling and kind of having yes. to remind ourselves. So, and I think that's, I mean, that's a big part of advocacy is making the most of the time. But I think another part, and we ask people like, there's no, you know, if you wanted to say, you know, I'm going to show up every year until you figure it out. That's great. You know, we'd have a consult clinic and, we like that because it's always, if I have a half an hour with somebody in front of me, they're in front of me. And I right. might say, you know what, actually, I went to this talk a couple months ago and the, like, the child in that slide looks just like, you know, I, let me write to Dr. So-and-so and see what they right. have. Seen. You know, there, there is some amount of serendipity in all of this. Yeah. And if you're in front of someone, you're in front of them. You have their undivided attention. Like there's well, that's how we really grew our community. Our yeah. neurologist put Lily on a stage in front of 4,000 people at a conference and discussed the disease. And yeah. our, it was like the dam opened up because everybody went home from that conference. They looked at their, their patients and they called. Yeah. So um, I think we're at time for questions. Cindy, are you... Um, are you ready for us to answer questions? Are there any questions to answer? Sure, if you wanna keep going, do you have any other questions that you wanna ask? Nope. Or nope. Those are the ones okay. I had on my list. Okay, um, so continue to submit your questions. So the first one I have is, so is epilepsy a diagnosis or a symptom? And if it's my current diagnosis, what should we do? What do I need to say to my child's uh, doctor to get an actual diagnosis? Yeah, so yes and yes. <laughs> you know, it is, it's a diagnosis in the sense that it, you know, it has a definition. It's a tendency to unprovoked seizures, um, but it's a descriptive diagnosis. Um, it's useful sometimes to have sort of these broader descriptive diagnoses because you know, medicines are approved for treatment of epilepsy schools have heard of epilepsy. They understand that they need, might need emergency treatments in the cabinet for a child with epilepsy. So it is the diagnosis and there's sort of, you know, a little bit of a history to this, which is that before we had specific causes, all we had was that descriptive diagnosis. And it was something that would sort of anchor you and kind of put you in the right, on the right track, at least in terms of symptomatic treatment. But now that we know that there are specific causes that you could have, if you don't have a specific cause or you don't know if you've got a specific cause, the question to ask, you know, whether it's been a couple months or a couple of years or a couple of decades is so, you know, thanks for refilling my prescription, but can, can we talk about why my child has this? And if the answer is, well, we're not sure, you know, I think it's, you could sort of politely say, well, you know, if we're not sure, I keep hearing that genetic causes might be the answer to a lot of the unexplained conditions. Can we start to look? And, you know, there's some, some physicians will have time to do that. Many will say, I, 
don't have the bandwidth to do that. I don't have a genetic counselor in my clinic. I don't have a genetic counseling assistant or anybody who can help us figure out if insurance will cover it. I don't want you to get an $8,000 bill, you know? And so the initial sort of, oh, no, we can't do that was often because of time personnel and insurance things. I think there are more and more resources, you know, CNF has some, um, Epilepsy Foundation has some, you know, various resources where you can sort of go and say, well, if, if my doctor can't do this, who can help me talk through this? Who can help us figure out how to get this done? Often it's a genetics clinic. So in some hospitals, a geneticist will have a genetic counselor working with them and they do know how the system works and they may not be the expert in epilepsy or the expert in a specific set of neurological conditions, but they are the expert in thinking broadly about genetics and getting testing done and will have teams and resources. So in many places you'll send family to a genetics colleague to sort of do, do that. And often the genetics colleague will, you know, take a family history in a way that a neurologist might not. Um, and then hopefully collaborate and say, this is really interesting. And maybe come back and say, wow, I learned this really interesting thing about this patient you sent. Do you have other patients like this? I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot to be learned from the teamwork. And I, you know, everybody is busy and certainly in a busy practice where people are seeing two to three patients an hour, you don't have the hour to do the genetic counseling yourself. You just don't have it. So you really need to find either genetic counselors with whom to partner or geneticists who have genetic counselors who can do a lot of the really vital pre and post test counseling. So all of the expectations that we were talking about, what, what comes from a test, what might come from a test, what might we do about it? That's really important. Uh, you know, in the old days when the tests were first orderable, people were like, hey, I'm gonna order this, I'm gonna order this. And you'd get these kind of doozies of answers back and people would say, oh, you know, Anne, can you see this family that, you know, they're, they're going on the internet and they're reading about this gene and, you know, and it's really bad news. Like did, you, you can't do that. You can't just like order a test and then say, Hey, here's a bombshell. See you later. <laughs> like, you know, there has to be counseling. And I think the field of child neurology has very much appreciated that now, but I think in the early days, there were, there were some rough times where it just, things were sort of happening with good intentions, but didn't always, the delivery wasn't always optimized. And so I think we're learning to find, find the right teams for, for people to, to be able to do that. So I know when we looked into this last year that there aren't a lot of genetic counselors available. Some are um, with research hospitals, but really only can do the genetic testing for people in the research programs. How can, how can families get, if they're at a clinic or their doctor doesn't have a genetic counselor, how do they get referred to a genetic counselor? I would ask to see a geneticist um, because they'll have that whole sort of team set up. Um, now, if it's a child, it probably requires going to a pediatric hospital, which isn't necessarily, or, or sort of a pediatric hospital within a hospital, which is often the case. Not everybody in every part of the country is going to have access to a pediatric hospital. Um, and some places can refer, um, insurance allows that, but sometimes it means a six hour drive, which is not something you necessarily want to have to make all of your families do. But I, I think, you know, in, in terms of access and, you know, really true access and equitable access to people who are resourced with educational resources, as well as the ability to travel, that's pretty straightforward. But what about everybody who's maybe not resourced to travel or not you know, somebody who's read about these things or has time to read about these things and expect their doctor to be with the one reading about these things. I think that's where we have a big gap. So I think we've got to do more outreach from our end as well. Um, and then partner with foundations who can help get the word out. Right. Yeah, I know. I know my son had genetic testing. Unfortunately, it was during COVID. So we will do it virtually and they mailed us the test kit and we, you know, took it to a lab and mailed it back. But um Hopefully that will continue to be an option for families, but I think getting the referral is, um, is important. Uh, next question, Dr. Padura, you mentioned that each and every prescription is a risk that the clinician is taking. I agree. How do you suggest finding a clinician who was more open to look outside the box of the usual treatments and take a little more risk based on preliminary research on specific variants within specific genes? So, you know, I think it's all about information, right? We have to have as much information as we can. And when things get into higher risk situations, sometimes risk tolerance is dictated by how severe the clinical situation is. And specifically what's in my head now is cancer, right? You think about the cancer model and a lot of 
us will say, well, if we could be as organized as cancer, everybody who came in with such and such condition would be enrolled in a clinical trial. Just that's just what it is. You know, you have your, your leukemia, you're in a clinical trial. If you're this age, it's this trial, this age, this trial, these markers, it's this trial. You know, it's the richness of information now about outcomes and genetic profiles and so on for cancer has taken that field there. And it's always a risk benefit, but the cost of doing nothing is you're just going to do nothing and let the child succumb to the cancer. That's not acceptable. You know, we have to sort of find a happy medium in child neurology for a lot of the conditions we treat because in large part, the mentality sometimes is, well, do no harm. Let's not do anything that might be harmful. Um, and therefore, let's just let the status quo continue to roll out. And in many cases, the status quo is just not okay, right? And you, okay, you can speak to this, but the status quo is often pretty not okay. Um, and so doing nothing also has to be considered an active decision. Um, you know, I think back to when I did my master's in public health, I took this great course on, on decision analysis. And you sort of think, well, do I do option A or option B? And implicit is option nothing. Um, and we don't always articulate that very well. You know, we, we could try this drug, we could try that drug, or we could say, you know what, the risks of those two drugs are unacceptable. We're going to stay the course, but we're not going to stay the course passively like we don't care. We're going to make an active decision that the risks of the other options are too high. We're going to take the risk of doing nothing, which is that things are going to continue. So that's sort of the overall philosophy. How, where do you, and how do you find someone willing to take a risk? Um, depends on what kind of a risk. And this is where it's really case by case. And I think there are, you know, in a hospital where there are trials going on, um, if, if there's a possibility of a single case trial based on preliminary data, then it has to go through scientific review, it has to go through IRB human subjects review, it has to, often we call our cancer colleagues in and say, hey, you know, you guys do this every day. What do you think about this risk benefit analysis? What do you think about the preclinical data? And so it really takes a large amount of infrastructure with neuroscientists, neurologists, often clinical trials folks from other fields to sort of collectively weigh the risks and benefits to say, you know, is this something that we should offer to a family? Or should we say, you know what, we think the risks are not justified because the potential benefits aren't demonstrated enough. And I, you know, I say that as if it's an equation on a blackboard, which doesn't take into account the urgency. And it's uh, what's really driving these conversations is not that anybody wants to put their child at risk, but that there's an urgency because the doing nothing is not satisfactory. So, you know, that's, how do you find those people? Um, I think you have the conversation, right? You bring the scientists with you if you need to, and you sort of say, here's the information we have. This is the best we've got. Would somebody take it to the next level of a trial or would they, you know, is it something that an institution or a provider could do? Um, or if not, what are the missing pieces? And, you know, as you can imagine, all of this takes a lot of time and infrastructure, and that's not easy to come by. Um, there are some foundations who are willing to do that and advocate for families. Um, there's foundations that'll sort of are open for applications and you can submit your clinical history and you've got to have a physician who will partner with you to say, you know, here's the history. And if you if you could come up with something that would genetically modify the whatever's going on and that could be moved from basic science to a clinical trial, would you, the doctor, be willing to look at the data? That's a great first step, but then, you know, Fast forward several years, you could come up with lots of information and the hospital could say, well, that's an unacceptable risk. You know, we're not, so I think there's, it's, it's not easy. Um, it, I think there are some lucky times where we sort of say, hey, look, here's the pathway involved. We could modify the pathway. There's preclinical data that's published. We can call those people and say, you know, do you think this person would benefit from this compound? Because it looks like it'll address it. And this compound is something already FDA approved. That's pretty straightforward. Then you're sort of using something off label. You acknowledge that it's off label. Talk to your hospital regulatory. You know, do we need to do a protocol or is this, you know, safe off label? Can we just use it? That's an easier conversation. But, you know, the more modern conversation is what about a viral vector we want to inject into the spinal fluid or an antisensal nucleotide we want to have injected at every so many week intervals that might be well tolerated, might have XYZ side effects and may or may not work because this is the first of its kind. That's a harder conversation and that's where preclinical data are gonna be really important. So it's it, right now it's case by case, which means slow. Um, so I, one more question and the, it, so if you have, if your insurance isn't approving genetic testing and you can't afford it, 
but your symptoms match a genetic diagnosis, can you can the doctor prescribe medication without the genetic diagnosis if it's known and you know I guess it depends maybe like what you were just saying um, and if you really need the diagnosis do you have tips on how to get genetic testing covered yeah so the answer is sometimes <laughs> um, so you know there are some genetic conditions where the set of symptoms that a child might have are not 100% specific, but are highly suggestive. So for example, if you have, I'm gonna keep harkening back to my epilepsy repertoire because that's my day to day, but you know, seizures with fever at six months of life involving the right side, and then three months later, it's involving the left side and you have a normal EEG. And then three months later, you've got spikes on the EEG and the development is plateauing. If you ask any epileptologist or child neurologist, what does that sound like? They'll say, well, that sounds like Dravet syndrome. And everybody knows it's SCN1A until proven otherwise. Nine times out of 10, you'll make that diagnosis right away. Another of those 10, you know, if I have 100 kids with that presentation, 90 will have a pathogenic variant or a likely pathogenic variant in SCN1A. The other 10, you know in your heart of hearts, it's probably a CN1A. It's a couple other things that can mimic it, but by the time the child is, you know, 18 months, two years of age, if you haven't found an alternate explanation, it's probably a CN1A, maybe it's in a non-coding region. So that's where you say, you know what, I've got to treat the symptoms. I might as well treat the symptoms in a way that takes that knowledge into account that it's probably SCN1A. So you know what, I'm probably gonna avoid the sodium channel blockers that somebody with a definite SCN1A diagnosis would avoid. Um, but am I gonna enroll them in a specific trial to do a gene modification for SCN1A? I'm not. So what do you do? You keep looking, um, but that's, that's a highly specific situation. But what if it could be SCN2A or 8A or KCNQ2 and I don't know yet, then you really can't treat with any specificity. You've got to keep pushing for the diagnosis. Okay. Um, I'm going to do this last question because I think it's quick. Um, if you've had genetic testing, nothing was found at the time, how long do you wait to get genetic testing done again? I would say bug your provider once a year. I mean, I always tell people, you know, if you ping me in a year, we can relook at the data, if it's a research data set, or we can ping the, the clinical testing center and ask if they're open to a reanalysis. I know each testing company has a different period of time and how often they'll do it. Some of them, you know, after two years, they'll do a, a single free reanalysis, but then you're done. So you want to wait long enough that the knowledge that may have accrued will influence that reanalysis, but not so long that you're just waiting and waiting. But I would say, you know, Get in touch with your provider once a year and say, hey, have you got anything for me yet? And if not, can we do something different? Should we be doing it? You know, got anything else for me to enroll? My, my patients will sometimes come and like, all right, what do you got, Paduri? <laughs> you haven't figured this out yet. So what's next? Right. And so do that. And it, it's sort of, again, it's like Gay and I were saying earlier, you know, the person in front of you is going to have your attention. Uh, so get yourself in front and, uh, and get, get our attention so we can sort of push things to the next level on a regular basis. Awesome. Uh, well, Thank you both. I have a quick little uh, wrap up here. Uh, um, let's see. I will be sharing out information on the neurologist visit checklist with everybody. Also, we have this upcoming webinar about including siblings in conversations about rare diagnosis. Um, the URL URL is there. I will also include it in the follow up email from this event. And with that, I just really want to thank our speakers today. Thank everyone who joined us today. And we look forward to seeing you at our next uh, webinar event. Thank you so much. Have a good day.